Range Rover was built between 1970 and 1996 and basically defined its own market sector for the whole world. Nothing had quite been seen like this before. And because of that, early cars are really fetching serious money now. But you can get yourself into a later car for a lot less than you think. But under the bonnet, there are a lot of changes. Inside, there are a lot of changes as well. And to take you through a few of those and the things you need to look out for if you want to buy one, here's Martin. So if you're after buying a Discovery 1, you're probably after one of two things. First is a nice original early example, as these are set to rise in value and follow the trend of the Range Rover Classic. The second, like this one, is a modified vehicle that you can use for camping, overlanding, green laning, off-roading. It's just a fantastic all-round Land Rover and they're still quite cheap. So we'll have a look at the things that you need to look for when you're buying one. The biggest killer of these is rust. It sent many of them to the scrapyard. So if it has been under sealed from you, that can be a bonus, but also be aware that rust's rust proofer can be used to cover up a lot of bad welding repairs. So make sure the underneath is solid. Starting at the front inner wings, when we've got the bonnet open inside the workshop, we'll show you where to look for corrosion and rust in those. Moving back, the lower sills, outer sills and inner sills rust really badly, as do the bottom of the door pillars on the A pillar and the B pillar. If you've got a vehicle with twin sunroofs like this one, chances are they will have been sealed up and that's because water lashes in through the top, sits in the carpet and the sand deadening, and then rots all the floors. Moving down the vehicle, you wanna be checking for any significant damage. Scratches like this aren't too much of a problem if you're gonna use the vehicle for green laning or off-roading. These suffer from the same affliction as defenders where they use aluminium, which meets steel. As electrolysis happens here and the paint can flake off. It just looks a little bit scruffy, but nothing major to worry about. You wanna open the rear door and check the outer wheel arch because these rust really badly. This one's been repaired before. If you look at the bottom of the outer wheel arch, you can get an indication of what the sills are like. Again, this one's been repaired already, so that's no problem there. But as you can see, the rust comes through where dirt and muck gets chucked off the road wheel and it chips the paint and then starts the corrosion. Moving around to the back, you'll see again, just checking the bodywork as you go. There's more electrolysis around the rear lights. They're quite bad for this. Paint chips off and it just looks scruffy. So again, not a massive problem if you're gonna use the vehicle off-road, but if you're looking for a really nice original one, you want to avoid that. Moving around to the rear door. Again, as with the fender, because these have the spare wheels on, the hinge is under a lot of stress. So just pop the back door open, give it a little rock to make sure there's no play. Whilst you've got the back door open, have a little look inside the shut line, just to make sure there's no rust in here because they readily corrode. And if the seller's happy for you to do so, peel up the mat or the carpet in the boot and have a look, check for rust in there as well, because they do rust quite badly in the boot floors. And then you can check the other side of the vehicle. So now we'll head into the workshop and have a look underneath at all the rust spots you need to check for under there. So the first thing you need to check at the back of the vehicle are the two rear body mounts. And these are up on either side of the chassis. This rear cross members is quite a big job to replace when it is rusty and getting the body aligned properly again afterwards can be a bit tricky. So make sure they are solid. These look okay on here. Most discoveries would have had anti-roll bars fitted at the factory but quite often they've been removed as they tend to limit axle articulation when you're off-road, so make sure they're still in place. Check for off-road damage on the rear axle, on the chassis rails. If it's knocked any of the paint off, that can start corrosion in the chassis, so make sure everything looks solid. As you get to these body mounts, make sure the metal around them is solid, the inner and outer sills on both sides. Moving forward further, just check the chassis rails are solid all the way along. And you'll notice, as with most Land Rovers, you'll get slight oil leaks around things like on the transfer box here. You don't need to worry too much about that, but if it's really pouring out, then you need to budget accordingly. Carry on forward. Again, anywhere there's a body mount, just make sure there's no rust around them. Inner and outer sills should be solid. Carrying on forward. Have a look at the suspension bushes. If it looks like they haven't been changed for a long time, it's not a particularly expensive item to replace, but it is time consuming, quite labor intensive. So 
make sure they're in good condition. If they're not, when you test drive the vehicle, do some heavy braking, see if it pulls from side to side. Going forward further still, check the floors in the front footwells. If the vehicle has got sunroofs, there's a good chance that the carpet and the sound deadening will all be sodden with water and that's what rusts the floors out. So give them a good poke, make sure there's no excessive corrosion there because that's quite a big job to repair as well. Check the engine for oil leaks. Again, a bit of staining and light covering of oil is normal, but if there's anything really pouring out, take that into consideration because that will need to be fixed. And then right at the front, just check the steering drag link and track rod. Make sure they're not bent, they look straight. And again, checking for off-road damage to the front differential pan. Make sure the steering box isn't leaking. If it is, there's a possibility the vehicle could fail its next MOT. So if it is dripping power steering fluid, just take that into consideration because it may need a full rebuild or you might get away with just changing one of the seals. And then right at the front, make sure if it's an automatic, make sure the gearbox oil cooler pipes are in good condition, haven't been crushed by anything off-road. Just give, have a general look around the front of the car, make sure everything looks straight. Again, front body mounts as well, and the inner wings. Make sure there's no holes or corrosion. If there is, again, budget for those repairs. So another thing to check are the swivel balls on the front axle. Make sure they're not leaking excessively, a little bit of misting is normal, but if the balls themselves look pitted or corroded, you need to budget for that repair because, again, it's a MOT failure if they're leaking excessively. Um, quite an involved job to replace those. So if you're not DIY savvy, then set aside some cash to have them done. So with the underside of the vehicle checked, we're now gonna lower it down and have a look under the bonnet. So heading under the bonnet of the Discovery, if you're looking at a diesel model, you'll either be met with the 200 TDI, which has a green dipstick, or the 300 TDI, which has a yellow dipstick. Both are brilliant engines, very rugged, very hard wearing. They do like regular servicing and their cam belts need to be replaced either every 60,000 miles or five or six years. First thing to check, is the water level in the coolant header tank. 300 TDIs are slightly more susceptible to overheating and head gasket damage if the coolant level is allowed to get too low. And it's generally the P gasket between the water pump housing and the block that leaks and allows the level to drop. Take a good look around the engine bay, make sure there are no major oil leaks. Again, they're old diesel engines, so there'll be a little bit of minor weeping and staining around the engine, but anything that's really dripping should be looked at. Check the power steering level. If the fluid's low or discolored, or it looks like it's got air in it, there's a possibility the power steering pump could be faulty or there's a leak in the system somewhere. Whilst you've got the bonnet open, it's a really good idea to check the inner wings more thoroughly. If you've already looked from underneath, check again from under the bonnet, just in case there's any little traps or little areas of rust that you haven't spotted already. So you're looking where the vertical panel of the inner wing meets the horizontal panel, around the battery tray, and on the other side, below the air box, and towards the back, near the washer bottle. Check the condition of the brake fluid. Just wipe the dirt away and see if it, if it looks particularly dark, it could have been missed on service, so that can give you an indication of how well the car's been looked after. Also check the suspension damper turrets. If these are left with a lot of mud caked around them, they can rust. Uh, they're not too hard to replace and fairly cheap to buy, so don't worry too much if that's the case. On later 300 TDI models with automatic gearboxes, they will have electronic diesel control fitted, or EDC, which means you have a mass airflow sensor, an injector with a wire coming off it, and an electronically controlled fuel pump, which is here. On early automatics and manual models, these will have a normal mechanical fuel pump, and it's very common for people to play with these pumps to get a little bit more power, so if you're looking for a completely standard vehicle, make sure the anti-tamper cap on top hasn't been pried out so that you can adjust the smoke screw beneath. Finally, if the vehicle's been stood for a long time, it's possible that the valve stem seals have gone hard and brittle. So when you're driving the car, have a look in the rear view mirror. A little bit of black smoke's normal under hard acceleration, but if there's any blue smoke or white smoke, you need to be suspicious of that. If you're looking at a petrol discovery, it's more than likely gonna have the Rover V8 fitted. It'll either be 3.5 litre with carburetors on the really early models, 3.5 with EFI, or a 3.9 with EFI on the later versions. 
And these are all really great engines, but again, it's really important they're serviced on time. If they're not, you can get a heavy buildup of sludge and silt in the sump and in the top of the cylinder heads, which means lack of lubrication, worn camshafts and followers, and poor performance. So when you start the vehicle up from cold, have a listen to the top end, see if it's tappy, or if there's any untoward noises, suspect engine wear. It's also vital that the coolant's been changed on time. If the antifreeze mixture is allowed to get too weak or just gets too old, the alloy cylinder heads and block can corrode and go porous, which means lack of water, possible overheating, and then head gasket issues, which can be involved to sort out. So make sure the coolant's been changed on time as well as the oil. With the electronically controlled V8s, it's really important that they start up, idle smoothly, and perform well through the rev range. If there's any hesitation, misfires, anything like that, it could be anything from duff spark plugs to an airflow meter problem or any of the other sensors in the system. Uh, they're Lucas controlled systems on the EFIs, so can be tricky to diagnose but parts are cheap enough to get and quality parts are of course available from Britpart. So whichever engine you're looking for, make sure it starts easily, idles nicely, there's no misfires, no untoward smoke and that it pulls well through the rev range. And to check that, we're now gonna head out onto the road and give this one a test drive. So the interiors on these early discoveries are quite rudimentary. You'll find they rattle and creak quite a lot as you go over bumps, but that's just part and parcel of the vehicle. Make sure the heater works properly. You should get nice and hot in a Discovery, unlike a Defender. Check the seats for damage and wear on the bolsters. Check wear on the steering wheel and any stickiness, because they do wear and as the sun heats them up, the glue can get tacky and they're not very nice to feel. Check the sunroofs work if they haven't been sealed up. The car might have manual winders or it might have electric buttons on the ES models. On three-door models, make sure the seat bases fold properly to allow people in and out of the back seats because these fail quite regularly and they're difficult to find replacements for. As you're driving the vehicle, check in the mirror to see if there's any smoke under acceleration. A little bit of black smoke is normal, but if there's white or blue smoke, then suspect there could be a problem with the engine. Steering should be reasonably direct. Make sure the vehicle doesn't list or pull to one side as you go down the road. And again, under braking, make sure the car doesn't pull to one side or the other. Should pull up nice and straight, just keep an eye on the steering wheel as you brake hard. If it tries to pull, obviously the steering wheel will turn. The gearboxes are generally good. The automatics do like regular servicing. Oil changes every 24,000 miles or so. If you haven't got any history of the automatic gearbox oil being changed, don't be tempted to change the oil straight away as the detergents in the new oil could dislodge some debris in the valve block and cause problems in the gearbox. Manual gearboxes are generally sturdy. The LT77 will be fitted to the 200 series and the R380 will be fitted to the 300 series. And these can suffer with slight problems with engaging second gear when the gearboxes are cold, but as soon as you've done a mile or so, the oil should warm up and you should be able to get in and out of all the gears without problems. You want to be listening for whines from the transmission as you accelerate and come off the throttle. There shouldn't be any whines or whirs on overrun. If there are, that could indicate a problem with the gearbox, transfer box or one of the differentials. When checking through the service manuals on these vehicles, hopefully whoever's been servicing it will note when the transmission oils have been changed, which should be every other service, so two years or 24,000 miles. If you suspect the Discovery hasn't seen much off-road use, it's worth making sure that the diff lock and the transfer box engage high and low range properly. You just need to select neutral on the gearbox and then push the lever forwards to engage low range. It should slot in properly, and then you can try and drive to make sure it's engaged like so. Diff lock, push it across to the left. The orange light should come on on the dashboard to show you that diff lock is engaged. You can then pull it back over to the right, and the light should extinguish. If it doesn't go out straight away, don't worry, it will go out once the diff lock's disengaged as you drive away. While you've got the vehicle at a standstill, it's worth selecting first gear or drive and listening to see if there's any driveline shunt. If there is, that could signify a worn differential or maybe just the drive flanges on the end of the axles. If there's any driveline backlash between reverse and forward gears, that should be taken into account and budgeted for. If you're driving a manual model, take note of how much play there is when you change gear. Too much slack in the driveline could also be down to a worn transfer box input gear, which is caused by oil starvation on the splines. Luckily, Britpart do an uprated cross-drilled gear, which fixes this issue for good. So that wraps up the buyer's guide for the Discovery 1. 
They're brilliant, rugged vehicles, but if you get a collection of problems, they can prove costly, so buy wisely. For more videos on buying Land Rovers and how to look after them, check out the other videos in the Britpark Workshop series.